Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now in this university of life, you can fail, but you cannot drop out. And unto me, Jesus said, come unto me. That's the first invitation that he ever gave was in this passage. All ye that labor, that word labor means a toiler, a person that cannot find rest, and a heavy laden, they were laden down with the ceremonies of the law, the ceremonial law and the moral law of the Old Testament. All the rules that the Pharisees and the religious leaders had laid down, all the legalistic things, and they were laden down with it. They were laboring with it. Jesus said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. The rest of refreshment, not the rest of doing nothing. And this invitation is to men and women who have exhausted with the search for truth. You've become exhausted searching for the purpose and the meaning of life. Where did I come from? Why am I here and where am I going? I'm searching for a purpose and a meaning to my life. I'm searching for truth and you're exhausted from it. Jesus is claiming that the weary search for God ends with himself. He said, now you've found the truth. I am the truth. You can stop your searching. You've found it. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said, come to me, all ye that are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Wouldn't you like to have the relaxation and the rest that Jesus can give you? There's some of you watching by television that would like that. There's a number on your screen. You can pick up a phone and call right now and talk to a person who is trained to answer your questions and help you. Because you can have this relaxation and peace and forgiveness and joy that Christ can bring into your life. Pick up the phone now and call. But there are many people that want to escape from life. And they say with the psalmist, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and get out of the world. Have you ever wanted to do that? Just get out of the mess you're in? Get away from the pressures of life and fly away? Well, you can't. The psalmist longing to escape has become the cry of so many in our world today. The Bible is right up to date. It is the book of life for man, and it's never changed. The psalmist also said, I'm full of heaviness, and I look for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. And you've looked everywhere for help, and you haven't been able to find it. And I think that the, the period between about 14 and 25 is the toughest period in all of life because your body is changing. You're changing psychologically and physiologically, and yet you're asked to make some of the greatest decisions of your entire life. Where are you going to go to school? What kind of job do you want, or if you can even get a job? What is going to be your vocation? Who you're going to marry? And you're asked to make those lifetime decisions. What is going to be your philosophy in life? Who's going to guide you and direct you? What's going to be your religion? Because all of us are religious by nature. We believe that there's a God. I don't believe there are any atheists in this audience tonight. To those who feel there's no way out of their problem, Jesus said, I am the way out. Jesus said, learn of me. You see, Jesus was the professor at this university and he spoke as one having authority. And today I want us to sit at the feet of Jesus as a professor. Now there are three required courses in this university of life. Three required courses. You have to take them. There's nothing you can do about it. First, you've been born. Life itself. Now you didn't choose to be born. One man said to his son, son, if you had asked to be born, the answer would have been no. We were not consulted about living. Nothing we can do to stop living. You did not choose where you were going to be born, and you didn't choose what color skin you were going to have. 
That's the reason you shouldn't ever have racial prejudice. That person who may have white skin or that person who may have dark skin or a brown skin, they didn't ask, they didn't have a choice. Love them as fellow human beings and certainly love them as fellow Christians or believers if they are. So you cannot escape. You can't jump out of your skin. You can't jump out of your race. You can't jump out of life. You're here. So that's one fact that you can't change. Now the second required course is that you're going to die. You're born, you live, but you're going to die sometime. God said to Hezekiah, thou shalt die and not live. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Ecclesiastes says there's a time to be born and a time to die. It doesn't matter whether it's five years or ten years or fifty years from now, you're going to die. Many biblical characters and many people in history who lived many years, but they all died. There's a day, there's an hour, there's a minute already appointed, already set for your death. The Bible says, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds, and he cannot pass. There's only one man in history who did not have to die, and that was Jesus Christ. But he chose to die, to die for you in your place on the cross. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself, he said. He didn't have to die. He did it voluntarily because he loves you, and he loves you, and he loves you. And it's a wonderful thing to know that he's willing to help us carry the burdens of life, and that he loves us, and he's willing to forgive our sins, and our failures, and our mistakes, and we can start life all over again. We can be born anew, born afresh, born again. Think of it. He not only died on the cross, and they buried him. But he was raised from the dead, and he's coming back. He said, there's more. The best is yet to be. For to this end, Christ both died and rose, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If this is the end, if this life is all there is, we're miserable. What's life all about if this is it? We live a short time and we die? Then it's all over? Don't tell me that. There's a meaning to life. There's a purpose to life. And it's outlined in the Bible. Outlines exactly what it's going to be and tells you exactly how to do it. Death is never the last word in the life of a good person. There's life after death. Paul wrote to the Romans that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved. You shall be saved. If you're willing to acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior and you believe in your heart and commit yourself to a risen Christ, you can be saved tonight and you can know it. And then the third thing in this university that's required, and that is the judgment of God is required. Someday you will have to give a moral account of the life that you lived here. You see, from the moment that you were conceived, God has been watching you and recording in something called the books. Every thought that you ever think, every motive that you have, every decision that you make, Every word that you say, all the hidden things are there to be shown on the screen someday at the judgment and to be listened to. And you will be judged according to what is there unless you have come to the cross and repented of your sins and received Christ as Savior. Then the tapes are erased. The pictures are wiped out and even God cannot recall them.
It says God forgets our sins. He buries them in the depths of the sea. When you're born, your name is written in the books and everything you've ever done or thought or said are written in the books. When you receive Christ, really receive Him, I don't mean just joining a church, I mean really receiving Him, committing your life totally and completely to Him. When you do that, He wipes your name out of the books, blots it out, and writes your name in the book of life. And if your name is in the book of life, you're going to go to heaven. And you're going to have heaven here on earth from that moment on there. Oh, there'll be problems and sorrows and difficulties and all, but he'll be with you through them. And even when you come to die, he'll be there to hold your hand in that moment that you must face. Now, there are certain courses at the university that you can choose, the options in the university of life. First, you can choose your way of life. Joshua said, choose you this day. You have the right to choose. That's what makes us different from the animals, or at least partially different from the animals. We have the right of moral choice. You can choose. God doesn't coerce anybody into his kingdom. He doesn't make you obey him. You can choose. You can reject him if you want to. You can shake your fist at him if you want to. Or you can open your heart and let him in because the Bible teaches that he's knocking at your heart's door wanting to come in. The Bible teaches there are two roads of life. Either through the narrow gate for wide is, or enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many there be that go therein. But small is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. He said only a few of the people that have been born in the history of the world are going to find that narrow gate. They may find it, but they refuse to go in or they neglect to go in. The narrow gate is the cross. You have to come by the way of the cross. Oh, we like to have a cross around our neck. We like to have it embossed on our Bibles. We like to see beautiful gold crosses. We like to see the cross on the top of the steeples in the churches. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that old rugged cross where Christ died and shed his blood for you. You come to that cross and say, Lord, I am a sinner and I'm sorry and I'm willing to turn from my sins and I receive you from this moment on and I make total commitment to you without reservation. That's when your name is blotted out of the books and that's when you're walking on the narrow road. That's when you go through the narrow gate that leads to eternal life. Jeremiah said, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There are two ways set forth in the Bible. The way of life, the way of death. Which way are you on? Which road are you on? I'm asking you tonight to change roads because you're on the way of death. You're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Turn, change. You can. That's what this meeting is all about. That's why these men have worked and prayed and these women and young people to bring this all about so that people like you will change roads before it's too late. You see, Satan used a beautiful serpent to come and deceive Adam and Eve. And he tempts in three ways and he's tempting in those same three ways tonight to you. Appetite, beauty, pride. In Genesis 3, 6, she saw the forbidden fruit that it was good for food, appetite. Secondly, pleasant to the eyes, beauty. Make one wise, pride. Satan did not disguise himself when he tempted Christ in the same three ways. Jesus resisted him. And you know how Jesus resisted the devil when he came in the same three ways that he did to Eve? By quoting scripture. He didn't argue with the devil. He just quoted scripture. He said, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, he tempts you in the same three ways. There's first the lust of the eye. 
That's the appetite for things. Possessions can become the supreme object of your life. These things are not wrong, but when your life is centered in the acquisition of money and possessions, that's wrong. That becomes idol worship, and God hates idol worship more than any other sin. That's the lust of the eye. Then there's the lust of the flesh, pleasure. It looks beautiful. There's lust, physical things, luxury, entertainment, taking first place over God. And some of us are selling our souls for pleasure, overeating, wrong use of sex, too much alcohol. The scripture says, the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. That's what we heard a moment ago. It passes away. All of this that you see and hear and are doing will be gone in a short time. The only thing that'll last is what you've been doing for God and your faith in Him. Then there's the pride of life. That's position, the ego, with all of its self-centeredness. Not only are these things wrong in God's eyes, but they do not give permanent satisfaction. And then the second thing that you have a right to choose, you can choose who's master, who's going to be your master. The question put to Pilate was, what shall I do with Jesus? That was his question. What shall I do with Jesus? That's the most important question in the world. What are you going to do with Jesus? You cannot escape Jesus Christ in our generation. He's everywhere. All over the world, he's knocking at people's doors, asking to come in, not pushing the door open, just asking for you to turn the handle and say, come in, Lord Jesus, and take charge of my life. I'm making a mess of it. The disciples asked him in an earlier chapter, whom do men say that I am? He is the Lord and the Master the Son of God. And then thirdly, you can choose your destination. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Narrow is the gate and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. But you choose which road you're going to be on. That's your choice. That's your option. What are you going to do about it? You can make your commitment tonight to Christ and say yes to him. I've met three people already today that said that they made a commitment to Jesus Christ in one of our crusades somewhere. Well, three tonight. About four or five today in all. And they wouldn't turn back for anything. The joy and the peace and the sense of forgiveness and fulfillment that they found in Christ and the scripture says, come while you're young. Don't wait till you get older. Because you see, the older you get, the harder your heart becomes. And there'll come a time when the Spirit of God will speak to you, but your heart is too hard to hear. You've put it off too long. Come while you can. And many of you older people or senior citizens that may be here tonight, if God has even whispered to you, you come. This may be your last moment when you'll be so close to the kingdom of God. You open your heart and let Christ in. You say, what do I have to do? First, repent of your sins. The word repent means to change. Change your mind. Change your way of living. But you can't do that. You have no power to do that. There's some things in your life that you know are wrong that you cannot give up. But God will help you if you let him. And then the second thing, you must receive him by faith. Now the word faith means commitment, total commitment. I totally commit myself to Christ without reservation. I'm going to trust him and him alone for my salvation. And I want to know that I'm ready to meet him. You may be a member of the church. You may be a Sunday school teacher. You may even be a pastor of a church. But you're not sure about 
where you stand with God. There was a bishop on the West Coast summer before last that came forward in one of our crusades, and I went to him, and I asked him, I said, Sir, I said, why did you come forward tonight? You're the bishop of the church. He said, Mr. Graham, he said, I am a bishop, and I've read the Bible, and I've been religious for many years, but I have no assurance in my heart if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. I came forward tonight to be sure. I want to make sure. I'm going to ask you to come tonight and make sure. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. Now, it's not easy to follow Christ. I don't want you to get me wrong. It costs you something. You must deny self, all your selfish ambitions and dreams, and put them in his hands and say, Thy will be done, Lord. And then you must be willing to take up a cross. And that's not easy to take up a cross, a place of execution. Take your stand for Christ in your business or in school or here in Fort Lauderdale where you're visiting or where you live and let all of your neighbors and friends know that you're standing for Christ no matter what. That's taking up the cross because you'll be ridiculed. They may laugh and sneer and not as much as they used to. People are beginning to respect those that stand up for Christ. In our country, at least. I've been to some countries where it's hard to serve Christ. I've been to countries that you wouldn't think of, and they said, you know, we are persecuted for our faith in Christ, but we'd rather have our persecution than all the things you in America have to tempt us and pull us away from Christ. We'd rather have Christ and the suffering than to have a partial Christ or to be a halfway Christian with no suffering. I'm going to ask you to come tonight and say by coming, I want to follow Christ. I want to march with him. I want to follow his flag. I want to serve him. I want him to forgive my sins and give me the certainty that if I died, I'd go to heaven and that my sins are forgiven. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, and do what we've seen several thousand people do already in the first four nights. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform. And after you've come and stood here for a moment, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. You say, why do you ask people to come forward publicly? Because every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly that settles it and seals it in your life. You come forward tonight and make that commitment. If there's a doubt in your life, you make sure before you leave here because you may never have a chance like this again. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. We're going to wait on you. If you come from that stand back there, it takes about a minute, a minute and a half. Over here, the same. About a minute, maybe two minutes to come. As you see these many hundreds responding to this invitation to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you too can make that same commitment by calling the phone number that's on your screen right now. Counselors are waiting to talk with you, so make that call now. You that are watching by television, you can see that here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, hundreds of people are coming to make that commitment to Jesus Christ. You can make the same commitment where you are right now. And if you will, pick up the phone and call that number on the screen. And if you get a busy signal, they'll be there all evening. Keep calling and make that commitment over the phone with these hundreds of people that are coming here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida.
God bless you. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you. I want you to turn with me tonight to the sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel and the 24th verse. The sixth chapter and the 24th verse. These words, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism at the same time. You have to make a choice. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism. You know, there's a psychological vacuum in America tonight. Millions have no purpose for living and no motivating challenge. They want a cause to believe in. They want a song to sing and they want a flag to follow. Ernest Hemingway once said, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there's no current to plug into. Irvin S. Cobb once said, in politics, I'm a Democrat. In religion, I'm an innocent bystander. I remember a story that they used to tell out of the American Civil War. One man said, I'm neutral. So he put on gray trousers and a blue coat, and they shot at him from both sides. <laughs> Christ never allowed people to be bystanders and spectators. The word Christian is from the Latin, and it literally means partisan for Christ, a partisan for Christ. You know, they're having all that trouble down in Yugoslavia, and Mr. Tito died some time ago and left a vacuum in that country. And his people that followed him in fighting the Nazis during the war were called partisans. I rem I'm old enough to remember that myself. And they were called partisans. And they committed themselves. They believed in something. And those partisans never play at neutral. They never play at safe. They never sit on the fence. They are never spectators in the struggle of their times. They take sides. They commit themselves. I heard one in Texas, they asked this man, are you a Christian? He said, no, thank God, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> the word Christian in the early days was used in derision. It was a term of reproach. Many people have a wrong idea about what a Christian is. They think that a Christian is a person who prays, who lives by the golden rule, who is sincere, who goes to church, and who keeps the Ten Commandments. All those are good things. They're products, many times, of being a Christian, but that doesn't make you a Christian. That doesn't really make you a true follower of Jesus Christ. A Christian is one that three things has taken place in his life. First, he has made a choice. All the way through the Bible, we're asked to make a choice. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice and it affected the whole human race because they sinned against God and that became a disease that went from generation to generation and you and I have a 
disease that's going to end in physical death and spiritual death unless we return, unless we turn to Christ. Every choice we make affects other people. In Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, 30th chapter, Moses called upon the people of Israel, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Choose. Joshua, the 24th chapter, Joshua said to the people, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. I'm asking you tonight to make a choice. You have, many of you have a choice to make. I talked to a man on the telephone this afternoon and I asked him straight out, will you receive Christ as Savior? He said, not now. I'm going to think it over. I have too many questions to ask. And he made a choice, but he said, I'll watch on television and I'm praying that he'll make the right choice. In 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, Elijah said to all the people, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord God be God, follow him. If the devil is God, serve him. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go therein, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Think of it. Jesus said it's a narrow gate, it's a narrow road for eternal life, and only a few people are going to find it. Most of the people are going to be on the broad road that leads to destruction and judgment and hell. Which road are you on tonight? You have to make that choice before you leave here. And then secondly, a Christian is a person who has made a change, a change in the way you live. The Holy Spirit comes into your life when you receive Christ and he gives you the power to change your whole way of life. The scripture says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your mind, your emotions, your will are all involved in that change and it affects your whole life when you come to Christ. Many people have made statements about this very thing. Thing. Freud said people change by renewing their fixations. Adler, the great psychiatrist, used to say people change by renewing their goals. Rollo May used to say they change by renewing their efforts towards self-realization. But God says people change by renewing their minds. The Bible has a lot to say about the mind. When you come to Jesus Christ, you don't commit intellectual suicide. You come to Christ with your mind and you change your mind and that's repentance. You change your mind toward God. You change your mind toward sin. You change your mind toward yourself and you change your mind toward your neighbor and you begin to love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible is very clear. To change from a defeated, problem-oriented person depends on first changing the mind because our problems, emotional, upsets and feelings and behavior and goals are all rooted in wrong basic beliefs about how to meet our personal needs in Christ. The third thing, a Christian is a person who has accepted a challenge. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. How many of you are looking for a challenge? If any man will come after me, the first thing he must do is deny self, your own selfish ambitions, your own self goals. And you must come to the cross where Christ died for you and shed his blood. Because you see, you and I are sinners. We've all broken God's law and we deserve judgment. We deserve hell. We're going to end up in hell. We're going to end up at the judgment. But Christ came on the cross and by his stripes we are healed. When they took those long leather thongs with steel pellets and beat him across the back, he was doing that for you. When they put those nails in his hands, he was doing it for you. When they put that spear in his side, he was doing it for you. He went to hell for you. He took your judgment and your hell so that you'll never have to spend one minute in hell and you'll never have to face the great judgment of God. 
That's how much God loves you. God loves you. But he rose again. We don't worship a Christ who's still on a cross. We worship a living Christ. That's what Easter is all about. But God says that if you're to follow him, you're going to have to take up your cross daily. Every morning when you get up, you take up your cross. Now, what is your cross? The cross is the fact that Jesus went out to die on the cross. It was like saying, take up the electric chair and follow me today. Take up the gallows and follow me. You identify yourself with Christ openly and publicly and you're not ashamed of Christ. That's what it means. He would walk down the street and people, and he would call men and they would follow him. Now, some young people here tonight resist the idea of choice of any sort. We've been called the generation of the uncommitted. You don't want, you, they don't want to be called narrow. They don't want to close their minds. Christ taught clearly that there are two roads, two masters and two destinies. We cannot travel both roads, so we avoid the choice as long as we can. There's death in every choice. You die to one road when you go down the other. Life never allows neutrality without exacting a price. Try to be neutral in politics, and one day you'll be confronted with the ballot box. Try to be neutral about the race problem, and it'll, you'll be confronted in your block, in your neighborhood, or on your street, or in your school. And someday, it will come to you. You can't be non-involved in the issues of our day and the social problems of our day. You can't be involved with the thousands of people that walk the streets of King County with no place to sleep and nothing and very little to eat. We have to do something about it. That's the reason we have love and action. We know we can't feed all the hungry people, but we do it as an example as to what churches ought to be doing all the time. We ought to be extending a helping hand to help all of those that are in need. Some people don't want to be involved in their neighbor's problems. There's a time, though, when you must stand up and be counted. Jesus Christ demands that you decide, decide about him. Pilate asked, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Pilate washed his hands. You have to make a decision about Christ. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, some are reluctant to make the choice for Christ because of theology. Uh, you don't want to accept uh, all the things that the Scripture teaches about God and about Christ, even about God himself. The Bible says, I am the Lord God, I change not. The Bible says God is a God of love. And then there comes the Bible. What am I going to do about the Bible? I can't accept the Bible. Job says, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, it says all scriptures given by inspiration of God. The Bible is the inspired word of God. I don't ever spend five minutes wondering whether this is the word of God or not. I accepted this by faith years ago and I've never had a doubt about it since. When you accept it by faith, Nothing can move you. There are things I don't understand in the Bible. There are things that are almost apparent contradictions, but they're not. I just accept it as God's Word by faith. My problem is not the things I don't understand in the Bible, it's the things I do understand. Things that I do understand that I ought to be doing in obedience to Christ. That's what disturbs me. And then there are a lot of young people that say, well, I've heard about conversion and you want us to be converted? Yes, because Jesus said, except ye be converted and become as little children, you can't see the kingdom of God. What does conversion mean? It just means turn around. I'm going this direction. I turn and I start this direction in my life. That's conversion. 
just changing over. That's all it means. Don't make a big thing out of it. But it is a big thing because it depends, your eternity depends on whether you've been really converted or not. You have to be converted inside in your heart, not just the outward things. Many people think you're a good person because you go to church, you've been baptized, or maybe you've been confirmed in your church. But you need to come and reconfirm your confirmation vows. You need to come and reconfirm the baptism vows that you took or the baptism vows that your parents took. You need to come and make Christ real in your own life. And then some refuse Christ because of the church. How many times I hear the word, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, there's hypocrites in every area of life. I was born and reared on a dairy farm and we sold milk. And we would distribute the milk to the various customers and we'd get up early in the morning and uh, send our little dairy trucks out. And I would milk the cows and sometimes I'd go on the truck. And uh, we had several dairies in our area. And so the, when price of milk got so low, the farmers began to put water in the milk. Now they were hypocrites in the milk business. But that did not mean that they were not some real ones. My father would never stoop to such a thing as that. Now the one requirement for membership in the church is that you are unworthy to be a member. Christ himself founded the church. The church is made up of sinners that have been saved by the grace of God. There's no such thing as a perfect church. If you find a perfect church and you join it, it becomes imperfect. The church is for fellowship. The church is for strengthening our faith. The church has many things that it can contribute to you. But there's another reason that we sometimes say we don't want to come to Christ. We don't want to pay the price. If you want an education, you'll deny anything to get it. If you want wealth, you'll give up all sorts of things to attain it. Now God gave the very best he had for you. The scripture says he spared not his own son. The scripture says the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then there are other young people that are afraid of being misunderstood and ridiculed, do not want to be in such a small minority. The Bible teaches that there may be persecution. There will be. You will be misunderstood. You will be an outsider in many groups. In, and peer pressure is so powerful today in the various school levels, whether it's the university or whether it's the high school. The Bible teaches that you may be an outsider and you may have to seek some new friends because one of the things that happens is when you come to Christ, you enter a whole new social world and you will find that you will have brothers and sisters in every country of the world. It's a great fraternity that we join when we come to Christ. And it may not be just Episcopalians or Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostalist or Presbyterians or Catholic. It may be we just are Christ ones. I've been all over, the, well, not all over the world, but many parts of the world, and I've met people that were absolute strangers to me, but the moment we met, we were brothers. You might not be invited to certain parties. You might not be invited to certain things, and you may have to pay a price for a little while till you make new friends among believers. To follow Christ may be costly business. But the Apostle Paul said, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a part of the cost. It's not easy to follow Christ in 1991 in America. It's hard. It costs something. And then there are many young people that just put it off. You say, I'm going to wait till another time. Proverbs 27 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day will bring forth. The scripture says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In Lillian Roth's story in her book, I'll Cry Tomorrow, at a certain point she had this to say, I'm an alcoholic and I need help. 
You need to say tonight, I have sinned against God and I need help. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to be sure if I died now that I would go straight into heaven. Will you say that tonight? And if you're not certain of your relationship to Christ tonight, I'm going to ask you to make sure so that you can leave here and say, I know that Christ lives inside of me. And I'm going to ask you in a moment to get up out of your seat and say that. You must make that commitment. Don't sit on the fence any longer. Just stand out and say, I'm coming. A young man recovering from a motorcycle accident in which he nearly died saw that we were going to be in Sheffield, England for a crusade. And he said, I don't know anything about God, but I ought to hear that man. So he came. He did, and he accepted Christ, and he told his counselor, I almost died without faith. When we went one of the places, I forget, some city, there was a 16-year-old girl that gave her life to Christ, and the next night she found her counselor and said, I want to give you a change of address. I'm going back to live with my parents. They came here tonight, and we were reconciled. George Williams, who founded the YMCA, came to Christ in the 19th century in England's West Country, and he wrote this, I cannot describe to you the joy and the peace which flowed into my soul when first I saw that the Lord Jesus had died for my sins and that they were all forgiven. Do you know Christ? Are you certain of it? If there's a doubt in your heart and mind, make sure tonight. I read the life story some years ago of Francisco Pizarro. It brought back to mind today when I was reading about the trouble they're having in Peru. In the 16th century, he conquered Peru. In the midst of great difficulties, when he only had a handful of men left, he drew a line with his sword on the ground. One way was to Peru with riches and danger, and the other was back toward Panama where their ships were and security. He chose to march south to Peru and became the founder of that great nation. Tonight, you stand at the crossroads of your life you step across that line that has been drawn in the sand by our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, repent of your sin, be converted, come to me. I will change your life. I'll make you a new person. I'll give you new power, a new joy, a new peace, a new happiness. I'm going to ask you to come. And by coming, you are saying, I open my heart and give my life to Christ. I want a change in my life. Get up and come.